Hello viewers, welcome to Newsweek South Asia, a show where we will provide you fresh insights into South Asia's geopolitical, strategic and security situation. Let's begin the show with the headlines first. Baloch resistance against Pakistani army intensifies in Balochistan. Indian security forces foil terrorist infiltration attempt in Jammu and Kashmir's Kupwara neutralized three terrorists. And three years after the Taliban's return to power, Afghan women face unprecedented repression. In Balochistan, Pakistan's largest and resource-rich province, the ongoing nationalist movement has once again erupted into violence. Recent deadly attacks by the Baloch Liberation Army targeting Pakistani forces and infrastructure shows the deepening crisis and the Baloch people's growing anger and desperation. As Pakistan Army has intensified its operation against the Baloch freedom fighters, they are also facing counterattacks. Here's a detailed report on the latest developments in this volatile region. On August 26th, a wave of deadly attacks swept through southwestern Balochistan, claiming the lives of at least 70 people, including 14 Pakistani soldiers. The coordinated assaults targeted police stations, railway lines and highways. The Baloch Liberation Army of PLA, an armed rebel group operating in the region, took responsibility for the carnage. In the deadliest incident, the BLA took control of a highway and shot dead at least 23 people. In a statement, the group revealed that their targets included security forces and that they had seized control of several highways across the province. I think this attack was inevitable. They have carried out such attacks in the past. When you subjugate and vandalize a people's nation for so long, you will get reaction, repercussions, and consequences. You will have to pay for what you've done. And this is what happened there, and this is what's happened. That's how I see it, the first phase of uh, Balochistan's liberation process. People will react. We have been killed, subjugated for too long. I mean, you can see Mohsen Nakui, you know, uh, the interior minister. He's, the, he's a cricket board chairman, but part-time interior minister. Yesterday, his comments, uh, the comments he made, makes us proud that, thank God, our enemy is a uh, duffers. Uh, he was appointed by the army as the interior minister. But he said, oh, this is meaningless attacks, or oh, just killing civilians, uh, pulling them off a bus. And two SHOs can handle the issue of Balochistan and the Baloch people. This is how illiterate and unaware or unbothered they are with the Balochistan cause. We can't justify violence anywhere and not justifying violence, be it by the Baloch or by the state, occupying state of Pakistan. But sometimes you reap what you sow. And I think that's what's happening in Balochistan right now. The Baloch Liberation Army traces its roots back to the 1970s during an armed struggle for control of Balochistan by leftist guerrilla groups. This movement was crushed with brutal force by the Pakistan Army. Over the past three years, the BLA has intensified its operations, transforming its hit-and-run tactics into larger-scale attacks, particularly against the growing Chinese presence in Gwadar and other parts of the province. The BLA claims that China's involvement in the region has only exacerbated the plight of the Baloch people, exploiting their natural resources while ignoring their basic needs. Balochistan's history is marred by repeated insurgencies dating back to Pakistan's annexations of the autonomous Baloch state of Kalat in 1948. Baloch groups have persistently clashed with Pakistani security forces, demanding autonomy for ethnic Baloch regions or complete independence from Islamabad's grip. Despite Pakistan's promises of economic development, the harsh reality on the ground paints a starkly different picture. 
with 70% of the population living in poverty and a large number of children out of school, Balochistan continues to grapple with severe challenges in education and healthcare. The influx of Chinese investment has only deepened concerns about Pakistan's growing debt to China and the impact on local communities. Gwadar City, once home to indigenous Baloch people, is now dominated by Chinese interests, leading to the displacement of local businesses and residents. China was duped by the Punjabi establishment of Pakistan into uh, signing up for this project. The Punjabis knew it's not going to go ahead. They, they knew it's not going to succeed. But they, again, they're looters, they're plunderers, and they're cheaters. And that's what they did. They duped India, uh, China into investing. And now China has opened its eyes. I mean, Balochistan is a big treasure trove. Everybody wants to get in on the game. And China, of course, is a new capitalist country. I'm sure it wanted the... It is Sandak and other projects. It has, it, I think it's got its money out anyway. It has tripled its investment, whatever it gave the Punjabis. China is going to pull out of this whole CPEC because it's not a viable. It's like, uh, how can I say it? It's like having a new factory being set up in Gaza, a chocolate factory, and you think it's going to work. There's war and terror and occupation and killing and bombing. How do you expect the in the industry complex to be operating over there? Nobody can take our land away from us. They can kill us. They can kill us. I mean, eventually the Baloch will win. We do not have to lose our will to fight and will to survive and will, will to stand up against this coward enemy. The Baloch see no political solution to their plight and have resorted to armed resistance against both Pakistan and China in Balochistan. While Baloch groups continue to fight for their rights, the Pakistan army has responded with increasing brutality, abducting, torturing and killing Baloch political activists, student leaders and intellectuals. Numerous global media outlets have repeatedly reported the discovery of the bodies of suspected separatists and political activists, suggesting a pattern of extrajudicial killings by Pakistani security forces. This cycle of violence and oppression has given rise to an insurgency with many Baloch taking up arms against Islamabad and increasingly against Chinese nationals who are seen as complicit in their oppression. Moving on, Indian security forces have intensified their operations to dismantle the intricate network of Pakistan-backed terrorism in India's Union territory of Jammu and Kashmir. These proactive measures come in response to Islamabad's persistent and desperate attempts to launch infiltration bids in the region. In a recent operation along the line of control in Jammu and Kashmir's Kupwara district, Indian security forces successfully neutralized at least three terrorists in two separate encounters. This comes as the region prepares for its first assembly elections in over a decade with heightened security measures in place. We have a report. In a significant development along the line of control in Jammu and Kashmir's Kupwara district, Indian security forces have successfully neutralized at least three terrorists in two separate encounters. On the intervening night of August 28-29, security forces in Jammu and Kashmir launched a massive operation in the Tangdhar sector after detecting the presence of terrorists attempting to infiltrate across the LOC. The operation was swift and precise, leading to the elimination of terrorists who were trying to breach the Indian territory. Soon after, another operation was initiated in the Machal sector, a known hotspot for infiltration attempts. Here, the vigilant troops of the 57 Rashtriya Rifles spotted two to three terrorists moving through the rock terrain. In a well-coordinated effort, these terrorists were engaged and neutralized by the alert forces. 
Pakistan Army is involved in training the terrorists. And when Pakistan Army and Special Action Group, they have, they have, they have decided that the standard of the terrorist attack has to be raised, so their commandos join in. Now, that is how they are infiltrating from the border, and they have an advantage that the sleeper cells are available to help them out, are available to give them all the logistics supply, the ammunition supply, boarding and lodging, water supply, all the things. So their job becomes easy. But the question is, why do we give them opportunity? First thing is, very clearly, they have over 20, or they have over 20 to 25 bases, training bases well within the POK from where they are launching. It is those bases which are the breeding grounds which have to be eliminated. The threat of cross-border terrorism has long been a reality for India, with terror camps and Pakistan playing a central role in fueling the conflict in Jammu and Kashmir. These camps, often located in Pakistan-occupied Jammu and Kashmir, are equipped to train terrorists in guerrilla warfare, bomb-making and the handling of sophisticated weaponry. Infiltration from these camps is not a random act but a well-organized operation involving careful planning and coordination. Routes are selected to maximize the chance of success, often taking advantage of difficult terrain and adverse weather conditions that can provide cover for the terrorists. Pakistan support extends beyond training, logistical support in the form of weapons, ammunition and communication equipment is also provided to these groups. Despite these challenges, Indian security forces have developed and implemented sophisticated counter-infiltration measures. Advanced surveillance technologies, including thermal imaging, drones and a robust border fencing system, are now critical components of the security apparatus along the line of control. कैंपें हैं टेरर फैक्ट्रीज हैं ये जो ऑर्गेनाइजेशन से हैं वो वहां पे ऑपरेट करते हैं और उनका दुकान उनकी कमाई और उनकी बिजनेस मॉडल इसी पर चलता है कि क्या हम अंदर डाल के खून खराबा कर पा रहे हैं अगर वो नहीं कर पा रहे हैं उनको भी वहां पे पैसा मिलना बंद हो जाता है उनको तरह तरह से जो पैसा मिलता है जगह जगह से उनकी बिजनेसेस में उनको अपनी सरकार से और अब दूसरे जरिए से जो मिलता है वो भी बंद हो जाता है The recent operations come at a particularly sensitive time as the region prepares for its first assembly elections in over a decade. The upcoming elections are seen as a crucial step in restoring normalcy and strengthening democratic governance in the region. The elections will be conducted in three phases with the first phase of voting scheduled for September 18. To ensure a peaceful and orderly electoral process, nearly 300 additional companies of paramilitary forces will be deployed across the Union territory. Thakur Randhir Singh, a local candidate from the Kalakot Sundarbani constituency, has voiced concerns about Pakistan's ongoing attempts to disrupt the elections. He noted that while Kashmir has seen a significant reduction in violence and an increase in development-focused discourse, Pakistan continues to sponsor efforts aimed at destabilizing the region. In the time of the war, there were always a lot of people in Kashmir. There were stone pelting. तो देखिए आज कश्मीर बिल्कुल शांत है और सभी लोग अपना अपना काम कारोबार कर रहे हैं और डेवलपमेंट की साइड लोग आज डेवलपमेंट की बात करते हैं हम आज मिलिटेंसी की बात नहीं करते लेकिन पाकिस्तान ने अपना काम लगातार जारी किया और रखा हुआ मैं आपको बताऊं बात के ये जो इलेक्शन है इलेक्शन को डिस्टर्ब करने की कोशिश की जा रही है जो जिन पार्टियों का उनसे लेना देना है वो शायद वो इन्वॉल्वमेंट करके तो वो चाहते हैं कि लोगों को डरा दुबका के वोट कम से कम वोट हो Pakistan's strategy of using terrorism as a state policy to achieve its objectives against India has not only failed but has also backfired. 
Decades of supporting and facilitating infiltration into Kashmir have done little to change the ground realities in the region. Instead, Pakistan is now grappling with the blowback of its policies, facing significant internal challenges posed by terrorism within its own borders. Internationally, Pakistan's involvement in supporting terrorism has led to widespread condemnation and growing isolation. The country's persistent failure to address the issue of terrorism within its own territory has resulted in a loss of credibility on the global stage. Moreover, the adverse effects of terrorism have not only destabilized Pakistan but have also severely hampered its economic growth and development prospects. Three years after the Taliban's takeover, Afghanistan remains a country in distress, with women bearing the brunt of the regime's harsh rule. Women who once had a hope for a brighter future are now living under one of the most draconian regimes in modern history. The Taliban's latest law have further tightened their grip on women's lives, stripping away basic rights and freedoms, from dress codes to speech. Our report will tell you more. It's been three years since the Taliban took control of Kabul, marking a dramatic shift in Afghanistan's socio-political landscape. Despite promises of economic recovery, the nation remains in turmoil with Afghan women bearing the brunt of Taliban's oppressive regime. From the outset, the Taliban imposed a series of harsh restrictions on women, imposing strict dress codes, denying them access to education, and silencing their voices in public life. Recently, the Taliban solidified their control by ratifying a new morality law in Afghanistan that introduces strict regulations on behavior and lifestyle. This law, which codifies many existing restrictions, has sparked significant concern due to its impact on daily life, particularly for women. Afghan women are now required to cover their entire bodies, including their faces, rendering the previously common hijab inadequate. Additionally, Women are not prohibited from singing, reciting or reading aloud in public as their voices are deemed intimate and should not be heard. Ravina Shamdasani, the chief spokesperson for the United Nations Human Rights Office, has condemned the law, calling for its immediate repeal. The newly adopted law on the promotion of virtue and the prevention of vice by the de facto authorities in Afghanistan cements policies that completely erase women's presence in public, silencing their voices and depriving them of their individual autonomy, effectively attempting to render them into faceless, voiceless shadows. This is utterly intolerable. UN High Commissioner for Human Rights Volker Ter calls for this egregious law to be immediately repealed. The long list of repressive provisions that this law imposes on women reinforces a number of existing restrictions that violate their fundamental human rights, including their freedom of movement, their freedom of expression, and their right to live free from discrimination. The law includes a requirement to wear clothes that completely cover their bodies from head to toe, including their faces, a ban for transport providers on transporting women unless they are accompanied by a male relative, and a prohibition on women's voices being heard in public. Disempowering and rendering invisible and voiceless half the population of Afghanistan will only worsen the human rights and humanitarian crisis in the country. The situation for Afghan women continues to worsen. They are now prohibited from making eye contact with men who are not their relatives by blood or marriage. Violations of these laws carry severe penalties, including warnings, property confiscation, or detention for up to three days. The Taliban's crackdown extends beyond its borders. The regime recently barred Richard Bennett 
the United Nations appointed special rapporteur from entering Afghanistan. The Taliban administration accuses him of spreading propaganda about their human rights violations. Bennett, who has previously suggested that the Taliban's treatment of women and girls could amount to a crime against humanity, has been monitoring the situation from outside the country since 2022. Rights groups and international observers have condemned these laws as a further erosion of women's rights in Afghanistan. Heather Bar of Human Rights Watch has voiced deep concern over the formalization of these rules, noting the continued crackdown on personal freedoms since the Taliban returned to power. It doesn't seem like a coincidence that this announcement by the Taliban has come so soon after the Doha 3 meeting. What the Taliban saw at the Doha 3 meeting is that the UN is going in several different directions at once. And while there's parts of the UN that are trying to uphold human rights and document Taliban abuses, there are other parts, as they saw at Doha 3, which are ready to make any compromise and to embolden and empower the Taliban as the UN did by agreeing at Doha 3 in response to Taliban demands to exclude Afghan women from the meeting and exclude from the agenda any formal discussion of the human rights crisis. So this is a deepening crisis and the international response is wildly unacceptable. And this moment right now with Richard having been barred from entering the country is, is a test of the international will to actually do something about the women's rights crisis in Afghanistan. Since taking power, the Taliban have systematically dismantled the progress made over the past two decades in advancing women's rights. Today, Afghan women and girls face widespread human rights abuses enforced through over 100 degrees restricting their rights to work, attend school, access health care and participate in public life. Even visiting parks, restaurants or beauty salons is forbidden. Afghanistan remains the only country in the world to institutionalize such extreme policies. Women have effectively become prisoners in their own homes with male relatives acting as their enforcers. This has led to severe mental health crisis and a humanitarian emergency. The Afghan economy is in free fall with poverty and food insecurity on the rise. As half the population is barred from contributing to the country's recovery. United Kashmir People's National Party in Pakistan occupied Jammu and Kashmir convened a political convention recently in Kotli where they shed light on a range of issues from human rights violations to the alleged exploitation of the region as a breeding ground for terrorism. The convention saw a major rally in Tharar, where locals protested against Pakistani administration and criticized the decision to deploy additional security forces, viewing it as a suppression of their rights. A report. The United Kashmir People's National Party held its annual central convention in the Kotli area of Pakistan-occupied Jammu and Kashmir. Key issues addressed included human rights violations, development challenges and the misuse of the territory for terrorism. UK PNP leader Sajid Hussain claimed that Islamabad is orchestrating genocide in POJK by deploying forces that have resulted in the deaths of local youths. Hussain vowed to continue the struggle against puppet authorities in POJK and to fight for equality, freedom and democracy in the region. आप 
जो वो रेंजर्स का दावा बोला और उस रेंजर्स के दावे के नतीजे में हमारे जो है वो तीन नौजवान शहीद हुए मैं उनको खराज तहसीन पेश करता हूँ उनकी कर्बानी रहेगा नहीं जाएगी During the convention, UKP NP leaders organized a major rally in the Thurar region of POJK. <laughs> Hundreds of locals joined, protesting against the Pakistani administration. Demonstrators carried banners and chanted slogans to voice their demands and grievances. The UKP NP previously criticized Pakistan's decision. authorized by interior minister mohsin nakvi to deploy security forces in pojk they argued this action aimed to suppress the local rights movement and was a betrayal of the kashmiri people the uk pnp contended that pakistan's presence in kashmir is both illegitimate and unjustified azim aur shukriya ke liye azadi ke liye jamhooriyat ke liye musawat ke liye आपके हकूक के लिए जदोजहद कर रही है हमारी सियासी जदोजहद है हमारी जो है वो डिप्लोमेटिक जदोजहद है There has been growing unrest in POJK and Gilgit Baltistan in recent months with people angry over issues like load shedding unfair taxes and the wheat crisis but Islamabad has continued to ignore their plight activists have long alleged that residents of the region have been at the receiving end of discriminatory policies from Pakistan which has failed to provide even basic facilities for them and with that we come to the end of this edition of newsweek south asia we'll be back next week with more news views and analysis from the subcontinent meanwhile do keep writing to us at nwsa@anin.com this is shivangi mishra signing off on behalf of the entire production team